Hey everybody, it's here to see you again, and sure glad that, that you're back. This time it's the Potter series number three. How are we like clay? This is a good one. It's pearls of wisdom, nuggets of knowledge, understanding the difficult, and instructions for a better life. Listen and learn. Hello everyone, glad you're back for the third installment of The Potter and the Clay and thank you my lovely assistant for being with me again. Notice your apron yeah. this week I'm ready. because of what happened last week. So we're going to read again in Jeremiah chapter 18. Uh, I just I like this passage of course because of uh, you know what it means with us what we're doing here and so I want to invite you to just listen to the word and I'm going to do a little bit of work while she reads the scripture okay the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying arise and go down to the potter's house where I will cause you to hear my words then I went down to the potter's house and there he was making something at the wheel and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter so he made it again into another vessel and good to the potter to make then the word of the lord came to me saying o house of israel can i not do with you as this potter says the lord look as the clay is in the potter's hand so are you in my hands o house of israel the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up, to pull down, and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. And the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it, if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good with which I said I would benefit it. All right. Have you ever thought about why exactly God used the illustration of the potter and the clay? There had to be a pretty important reason. Matter of fact, there's several scriptures in the Bible that talk about the potter and the clay. And I've thought a lot about exactly why. What is it about the clay that really symbolizes us in our relationship with God? Well, I found out pretty quick working with clay that it has to be totally moldable. There's some things that can keep it from being workable but it has to be moldable in the hands of the potter. Otherwise, the clay is no good to the potter. And in order for the potter to really make the vessel that he wants to make, he's got to have clay that's subject, if you will, to his hand, to where the clay does exactly what the potter wants it to do. In other words, you can't have renegade clay, right? You can't have rebellious clay. And God says that we're the clay. He's the potter. And I want to ask you tonight exactly who is in control of your life. Are you the clay trying to make the sh call the shots? Or are you the potter, uh, excuse me, are you the clay allowing the potter to call the shots? Clay in the hand of the potter that will not submit to the potter is of no good, no use to the potter. 
in order for a vessel to be made by the potter that really brings glory to the potter, the clay has to do what the potter wants it to do. I find that we have a challenge as we come to Christ of coming to the place to where we really do what the potter wants us to do. We can be renegade clay, if you will, and not submit to the potter's hand. There's another verse found in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 8. Now I want you to listen to this, okay? But now, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are the potter, our potter. And all we are the work of your hand. So, we are the work of God's hand. That's a very clear reference to the potter working with the clay. I think about when God formed Adam in the Garden of Eden and he fashioned out of the dust, the Bible says, the man. If that dust would have been rebelling and saying, no, I don't think I like the way that uh, you're forming me right now. I think I get you to do it my way. That wouldn't have been a very good creation, wouldn't it? Would it? Wouldn't have been a creation that God made. It would have been a creation that man or man to be would have made. And God has the right, the authority, to work with us in just the way that He wants to work with us. He can do exactly what he wants to do because he is the potter. We're the clay. We really, as clay, true to the analogy, don't really have any so as to what the potter does with our life. And isn't it amazing that we who pride ourselves in being in control have now come to the place that everything seems to be out of our control. I wonder if God could be saying to us during this time, I want to show you really who's in control. I, want, I wonder if God could be working through this time where we seemingly have lost control and can't have control to say, look to the potter who's the one that's to be in control. So as, as we live our life before God, it's really important that we evaluate our lives to see where we're allowing God to be in control and where we may be maintaining or trying to maintain control ourselves. When I first started, well, let me just show you this. This is the way that clay comes, okay? It comes in a block. Now you can dig it out of the creek if you want to, I guess, but that's a, that's a tough job, I would think. I've tried to dig some up in the past when I was swimming in the creek. It's not easy. But this is what potters get when they, when they begin to work with clay. One thing I found out about this, because when I first started working with clay, I just reached my hand in here and grabbed a handful, and I threw it on the wheel and started trying to center it. What I found out after a period of time is that I couldn't get it centered. And then after some research, I found out 
that clay actually has memory. Okay, now that sounds weird, but it remembers the last form that it was in. And if you just put it on the wheel and begin to center it like we did last week, it's going to try to go back to the form that it was last in. I think there's a tremendous parallel there with our life before Christ. You see, we, before we came to Jesus, we all had a history. We all have a past. And the old man, as the Bible says, will try to assert itself in our life. And the Bible says that we're to put on the new man and to put off the old man. So just as this clay has memory of what it what form it used to have, we too remember where we were. And what I've found is that just like clay, you see when a potter takes the clay when he first starts using clay out of the bag, he's got to knead it. He's got to uh, mold it with his hands so that it's usable. And if you don't do that, it has, it has um, air bubbles in it, and it also has memory, and so you'll never be able to form with it. So there's a lot of work that has to be done to this clay before it's ever even put on the wheel. And I think that there is a semblance there in our relationship with God. And that is when we come to Christ, we have to be moldable. We have to allow Him to shape us or to work with us so that we don't revert back in memory to where we used to be. Just like this clay has memory and it tries to go back if we're not moldable in the hands of the potter, then we can revert back to where we were. And I do believe that that's something that a lot of people need to consider. Maybe, maybe nowadays they're just looking a whole lot like they used to look before they came to Jesus. And they haven't been molded in the potter's hands. One of the primary things that you have to remember is that you have got to allow the hand of God to work you. It's not fun. It's not easy. Sometimes it's painful. Oh, sometimes we have to go through some difficult things. But in all that, God is working in us to get us to the place to where he can make something really beautiful out of us. And if we're not willing to allow him, I mean, if we put up walls and if we begin to say no and we begin to allow our old life back into our life to where we're doing things that we know that a Christian doesn't have any business doing, then what we're doing is we're telling God that he's not the potter, but we as the clay will call the shots. We're the ones who are in control. And God has, has said that, you know, as clay is in the potter's hand, so are we to be in his hand. And I find that many times, and I'm, I'm guilty of this too, as I think about myself, my relationship with the Lord, there have been times when I've said, yeah, I'm God's child. And I'm going to live for God, but God, I want you to do it my way. See, there's a, there's a word that's pretty popular in our world today. It's called narcissism. And narcissism is a, it's defined as a medical condition in which a person has an inflate, inflated sense of self-importance, okay? 
a medical condition. Everything's blamed on a medical condition nowadays. Medical condition where a person has an inflated sense of self-worth. I believe that we as God's children are narcissistic. Okay? You say, well, are you saying that I'm selfish? I'm, I've got an inflated sense of self-worth? No, it's worse than that. I'm saying we all do. Okay? We all have an inflated sense of self-worth. Jesus is the only one that's worth anything. <laughs> and if I have any worth in me, it's because Jesus is in me. And we need to remember that. Oh, um, if you study out narcissism a little bit, it, it they say that it's a condition that can't be cured, okay? And that's the truth if you don't know Jesus. But when you come to know Jesus, we're supposed to die to ourselves, become clay in the hands of the potter. They do say that narcissism can be treated, and the way it's treated is by talk therapy, okay? So I'm going to give you some talk therapy right now, all right? Give us some talk therapy. As we consider our life before God, His very clear example of using the potter and the clay shows us so clearly that we're just to be putty in his hands, that he is going to work in our lives. He will work in our lives, but it's going to be his way, his timing, his design, his plan, his will. I was talking with a couple of minister friends today. We were talking actually a little bit about narcissism and how that we in the church world have actually played into that. That in a large degree, we've made church about people. And we, we preach and try to tell people how they can get their best right now. How they can become rich in this life, how they can get the blessings of God, how that they, they can move the hand of God. Think about that a minute. The clay is going to move God's hand. The clay is going to move the potter's hand. Well, you know what? I don't have just a huge amount of experience on the potter's wheel. But I have figured out that if the clay is trying to move my hand, that I'll never be able to create a vessel that's worth anything. I, I've even heard a sermon before, I think, called Moving the Hand of God. Well, who, who do we think we are that we're going to move the hand of God? What we need is for God to move us, for us to submit to his hand. Clay is to be thoroughly, totally workable by the potter. And you know what? It's a wonderful thing when clay is moldable and usable and workable. But clay that has uh, problems to where it's not moldable, workable, usable, is no good to the potter whatsoever. I want Natalie to read 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 6. L listen to this. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. I believe that's a clear reference to God being the potter and us being the clay. And our responsibility is to humble ourselves under his hand because you know what? God's hand wants to work in our life. He does. 
But we can't make it about ourselves. We have to make it about Him. And when we do anything else than make it about Him, what we are is we're the clay trying to be trying to move the hand of the potter. <laughs> and in a way, that kind of makes us, puts us in the place of wanting to be God, doesn't it? I mean, if we're trying to change God's mind, if we're trying to get God to do what we want Him to do, if we're trying to get God to do the things that we think He should do, then maybe we really haven't even submitted to him as God in the first place. I, I was thinking earlier today, there's some things that we say that we think that we probably believe too, that just, they don't even match with the potter and the clay, with, with the Bible. One of them is, have you ever heard anybody say, well, you know, the Bible says, that God will never put more on me than I can handle. Well, that sounds good, doesn't it? But it's not in the Bible. Did you know that? It's not. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible does say that God will never tempt us above what we're able to handle. But the Bible does say that God will not put more on me than I can handle. I think a lot of times when we say that, when we think that, we're making it about ourselves. Well, I know that God will not let me down, will not do this or that to me because I'm more important than that. The truth is I've seen a lot of people go through a lot of stuff that was really more than they could handle. And it was because they weren't submitting to the hand of God. It is possible for us to go through things that we're not equipped to handle because we haven't been walking with God the way that we need to. There's another saying that says, God helps those who help themselves. That's not in the Bible either. Um, I think sometimes it's our excuse for us being in control, for us doing things, for us making sure that we, you know, work hard and all these other things. God helps those who help. No, God helps those who are submitted to Him, who are living their lives to glorify Him. And it may be that us helping ourselves is actually going contrary to God's design for us if we're not asking what the will of the Holy Spirit is in our lives. And then, here's a big one. You heard this one. God wants me to be happy. You ever heard that one? Where's that one found in the Bible? The Bible never says that God wants us to be happy. Now, happiness is a byproduct of us walking in the will of God and being submitted to him and yielding ourselves to him and we can be happy but that's only when we're walking in fellowship with God so it's really God first for us to play right and then what about this one we're all God's children well it'd be nice it'd be nice but the truth is, Jesus said there were some people that were the children of the devil. <laughs> and there were some people that were children of God. And we're not important enough to all be children of God. I mean, it's narcissistic to believe, for every person to believe themselves that they are right with God just because they're an American or just because of whatever. Um... Only those people who are children of God uh, only are only the ones that have submitted to His plan, His, His design, through coming by faith into, God, into relationship with God through receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Um, I, I think... 
I think sometimes we think God exists for us instead of it being the other way around, that we exist for God. I, again, I'll use the current circumstances, but I do believe that all this that's going on is really a, a tremendous grace gift of God to help us to really consider who He is and who we are and where we fall in our submissive role to Him. Um, we just celebrated Resurrection Sunday and what a what a wonderful time that was. Um, I, I want to remind you of what Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane as he was just on the just on the verge of going to the cross. It's found in Luke chapter twenty two, verse forty seven. Forty two. Forty two, I'm sorry. <clears throat> And he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So Jesus himself prayed and said, Father, I don't want my will. I want your will to happen. And it even in doing that, it meant his death. It meant he would die when he totally submitted himself to the will of the Father. And I, we don't know what it is going to cost us to totally submit ourselves to the will of the Father. But see, that's what clay in the hands of the potter does. We totally yield ourselves to him. And you know, maybe you don't like the present circumstances, but we're clay in the hands of the potter, so we don't complain about it. We just flow with God in it. We look for His will. And I'll tell you this, for those of you that love God, for those of you that love God, who've been called by Him, this whole thing is going to work out for the good to you who love God, who are called according to his purpose. And you're going to come out of this thing just, just closer to God and, and it's, going to be, it's going to be beautiful as God brings you higher and closer in your relationship with him. But for those who do not love him and receive the call of God that he's issued to them on their life, and I can tell you, you don't have that promise that it's going to all work together for the good. The best thing we can do is love God, submit to Him, yield to Him. I want you to turn back over to um, Jeremiah chapter 18 and read verse 6 one more time. 18, 6. O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter says the Lord. Look as the potter is look as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Okay. So as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you and I in the hand of the Lord. There's a liberty. There's a freedom in coming to the place to where we say, God I'm just clay in your hands. I, I'm just a blob waiting for you to make something out of me. That means that we have to die sometimes to our own will, to our own desires, to our own dreams, to our own plans. But we just totally yield ourselves into the hand of the potter. And then guess what? We'll see a little bit next week that he's going to begin to mold us and shape us into a vessel that he's pleased with. Not that we have fashioned ourselves. Think about this. If you ever seen any pottery and it was just beautiful and, and you said, wow, 
that clay did a wonderful job with itself in forming itself into that beautiful vessel. No, you didn't do that because the clay didn't do that. Too many people are trying to form something out of themselves that they'll be pleased with and maybe can get accolades from the world today. But what we need to do is pottery made by the potter that brings glory to the potter. And we need to let God do exactly what he wants to with our lives to make a beautiful vessel worthy of him that will actually bring glory to him. So, I'm uh, glad you joined us today, and um, we're going to go next week um, a little bit deeper at this, but I want to encourage you tonight as you spend time with the Lord before you go to bed, would you just, um, would you just affirm mm -hmm. to him that you want to be clay in his hands, that he would make out of you exactly what he wants to make. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the analogy of the potter and the clay. God, our greatest need, really, as your children, is to submit ourselves to you, that you be in control, and that we let you form us and make us, that we just allow you to do exactly what you want to do with us. God, we, we come before you now. There's a lot of people that are praying this prayer. And we say to you, we are clay in your hands. Mold us, make us into thy will. May you do exactly what you want to do with us. And we know that when you are in control, then we're in the best place that we could ever be in all of our life. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you. Enjoy being with you during this time, and we'll see you again soon, okay? Uh -huh.